Well, good evening and welcome to our evening service here in Chartridge. We're few in number, but we believe we're meeting in the name of the Lord and he'll, we trust he'll make his presence known to us. It's a rather warm evening. This morning I was uh, preaching in our local parish church in Harpenden and being a large traditional Anglican building, of course, it's lovely and cool. Um, that's one advantage. Most of the time, of course, it's too cool. So, uh, but it's not the temperature in the building that counts, but the warmth of the fellowship together. Our reading this evening is from Philippians chapter 3, beginning at verse 17 and going on to chapter 4, verse 7. So Philippians chapter 3, verse 17, and I'm reading from the ESV, the English Standard Version. Verse 17. Brothers, join in imitating me and keep your eyes on those who walk according to the example you have in us. For many, of whom I have often told you and now tell you even with tears, walk as enemies of the cross of Christ. Their end is destruction, their God is their belly and their glory in their shame, with minds set on earthly things. But our citizenship is in heaven, and from it we await a saviour, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body to be like his glorious body by the power that enables him even to subject all things to himself. Therefore, my brothers, whom I love and long for, my joy and crown, stand firm thus in the Lord, my beloved. I entreat you, Odia, and I entreat Suntike to agree in the Lord. Yes, I ask you also, true companion, help these women who have laboured side by side with me in the gospel, mm -hmm. together with Clement and the rest of my fellow workers, whose names are in the book of life. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again I will say, rejoice. Let your reasonable reasonableness be known to everyone. The Lord is at hand. Do not be anxious about anything. But in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. Paul's letter, Paul's epistle to the Philippians, that church in Philippi, the first church which he founded, or rather the Lord founded through his ministry in Europe, has been well loved by many. It's considered to be an epistle of joy. And Paul in it expresses his joy in that in the people there, in the believers there. And uh, we're concentrating mainly this evening on the first seven verses of chapter four, which starts with a therefore. Because when you start with a therefore in scripture, you see a therefore, you've got to ask, what's it therefore? And that's why we went back a few verses before. Paul, of course, was writing an epistle and is in, in the section from 7 there. We're looking basically at four basic headings. And their stability or steadfastness, unity or agreement, joy, rejoicing, and contentment or trust. And Paul picks these out for these believers. And, of course, perhaps the best-known verse in there is verse 4. Rejoice in the Lord always, and I will say rejoice. And it's easy to think, well, yeah, OK, Paul, that's what we're to do. That's what we're to try to do. But there's one little phrase that comes up all the way in, in, through those, and it's these three words, in the Lord. The Apostle Paul loves talking about being in the Lord, being in Christ. 132 times in his epistles, he talks about in Christ. If anyone is in Christ, he is a new creature, a new creation. Romans 8.1, there is now therefore no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Being in Christ is the key. And therefore, everything that follows... Everything that Paul's saying to these people is based on that. He starts off his epistle by telling them that uh, he's writing to all the saints in chapter 1, verse 1, in Christ Jesus, 
who are at Philippi with the overseers and deacons. Interesting that he doesn't put the, the people who are at Philippi first or in Chartridge or in Chesham or in Hertfordshire or in the UK. It's the saints in Christ Jesus. What's a saint? Same root as holiness. It's the root that means called out, set apart for a holy purpose. Because, of course, the people of God are the ecclesia, the called out people. God has called people to himself through the gospel, placed them in his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, as people for himself. And all the way through, when we look at the epistles, that's Paul's priority. The location doesn't matter. The problem today, I think, with so many churches is they're seeing themselves as independent of each other and building their own things, their own missions. The tragedy is so many large churches neglect the small churches. And their attitude is, get in your cars, come to us. Come to us. And you get the big churches with lots of staff, multiple pastors, youth workers, youth leaders, children's workers, um, women's workers, social workers, the lot. And it becomes, we're building a local congregation, forgetting that God has his people in each locality. God's called us. God's called you here in Chartridge. But he's called you first into his son. Chartridge is where you live or where you meet. But where you actually reside is in Christ Jesus. He picks that up in chapter 3 when he says our citizenship is in heaven. Philippi, of course, was a Roman colony. That meant that if you lived in Philippi, it was identical to living in Rome. You followed Roman law, Roman principles, low Roman taxation, everything. Although you were a long way away across the ocean, in fact, living in Philippi, you would, if you just landed, if you just woke up in Philippi, you would think that you were in Rome. And Paul says our citizenship, it isn't in Philippi, it's in heaven. So we are to think, we are to live as God's called out people as if we're in heaven now. You get this, of course, in Colossians chapter 3, where Paul says, If then, or since then, you've been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things that are above, not on things that are on earth. For you have died, died to your old life, and your life, your real life, is hidden um, in, with Christ, in God. And this is Paul's principle all the way through. Writing to these Philippians, he says he has joy when he prays for them because of their partnership. That's the fellowship word, koinonia, although partnership is probably a better translation. Their partnership together. You're part of, we're part of one body. The body, as Paul says in 1 Corinthians 12, has different parts, different functions. A body would be hopeless if it was just a head and everybody was a head, or everybody was a hand, or everybody was a foot or an eye. And often it's the hidden parts, the internal parts that people don't see that are vital to life. You don't see your heart, you don't see your lungs, you don't see your kidneys, but you couldn't exist, you couldn't survive without them. So we need to keep this broad thinking. Not broad in the sense of compromising on who believers are, who's actually in Christ, but for people who are who recognise, who have been converted, who have been called out by the Holy Spirit, born again of God's Spirit, given new hearts, new eyes to see, new ears, and new desire to love the Lord Jesus, to love the Word of God, and to want to live and witness for him, then we're all one in Christ Jesus. And perhaps key verse at the beginning section of chapter 1 is verse 6. Paul writing to these believers from prison. Now that's going to be significant when we get to rejoicing. But Paul at this time was writing an epistle of joy from prison. It was on his first imprisonment in, in, in Rome. 
two years house arrest. He had, he had certain liberties and so on. He could write four of our epistles, including this one. But it seems most, if not all of the time, he'd be chained to a Roman soldier. Paul, who loved to go about with the gospel, to go about with the word of God, I can, to a certain extent, um, empathise with, 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 with Paul. Because God's, the Lord's given me openings in three counties, Hertfordshire, Beds and, um, and Bucks, in a, now across the denominations, to go with God's word. Often smaller churches, six, no, seven Methodist churches in total in Buckinghamshire, where last week, last Sunday morning, I was in Amersham High Street Methodist Church at 9.30, Cheshire Methodist Church at 11 o'clock. It's, they're not evangelical churches, but the Lord has his people there. And a the great joy is going in with the word of God. And we've got folk from those, some of those churches who are uh, joining in on my Zoom Monday evening Bible um, teaching um, seminar, which we do on Zoom now, because we have people from all over, and others who are getting the recordings. And you say the Lord is opening hearts. They're there. Don't write off fellowships or people because they go to a denominational church and you think that denomination is dead. God has his people. We need to pray that, that men of God will be given openings to go in and to preach the word and they'll be called out. But of course we can be certain none of God's elect will be lost. The Lord will call them through the gospel. As he did with Lydia as he did with the jailer and the, the people who, before, who became the first converts in Philippi. But Paul was obsessed, you might say, with the Lord Jesus. It's amazing, you just read this epistle, how many times he refers to Christ Jesus, in Christ Jesus, the Lord Jesus Christ, through all his epistles. And in verse 21, of course, of chapter 1, he says, for me to live is Christ my life is all Christ I haven't got a life of my own now I've died to my own life he goes back saying I want to think Christ I want to speak Christ I want to sleep Christ I want to dream Christ and I long to be with Christ that was the apostle Paul's um, mission that was what he lived for and he's written to this church he's suffering of course but he's talking about rejoicing in that suffering. They are suffering because in the first century to come out as a believer, to say Jesus is Lord, for many meant intense persecution and suffering. For many it meant losing their goods, losing their freedom, and many of course were martyred. It meant their lives. And he's writing to these believers and therefore, he's saying at the beginning of chapter 4, Therefore, my brothers, having told them, having given a lot of testimony, chapter 3 in particular is one where you find he's forgotten everything that went before. He was a high-ranking Jewish leader. He could say, you know, I, I was up there. I was a scholar. I was top scholar. I, he was given authority. He was given respect. He'd have been given riches, and he says, I count it all as dung, as refuse, as rubbish for the sake of Christ. And he said, I want to know him. He said, I'm pressing on. I'm pressing on. I want to know him. And he says, that's what I want for you. He says, imitate me. He's not putting himself up and boasting. Look how wonderful I am. Be like me. He's saying, I'm living. I want to live for Christ. I want you to live for Christ as I do. And so when we get to the big chapter 4, verse 1, Therefore, my brothers, whom I love and long for. He finishes that, that verse there. We've got my beloved, double love. Paul was no fly-by-night fly, uh, fly itinerant evangelist and Bible teacher. He cared. He loved the people of God. He longed to see them built up, edified. He longed to see, as he wrote to the Colossians, Christ formed in them which was the hope of glory. That's what he lived for. That's what he gave himself for. And he could say to them, but what did he say for? What did he say to them? What did he want? Stand firm thus in the Lord. You see, we're apt to look at the world around us. I mean, just this last week, 
the, the media have been full of massive changes, changes at the head of government. I'm, some of you are older than me, I'm, I'm 70, and in my lifetime, We've seen massive changes in this country, and they're not, they've not largely been for the good at all. It said post-war, and some of you will remember, during the Second World War, that the king called the nation to humiliation and repentance, and it was echoed by Winston Churchill, the Prime Minister. And I've seen newsreel pictures, and some of you will be familiar with them, of crowds snaking along streets and round, waiting to get into church, to acknowledge God and to pray for deliverance during the war. But we've just had a pandemic. We've just got, we've got a war now. We've got uh, massive problems with the economy. We've got people who are worried about their jobs, worried about their health, worried about their children, their education, etc., etc. Has there been in official quarters a single mention of God? Totally the opposite. But more importantly, more tragically, where are the church leaders who have stood up and called the nation back to God and said, there is an answer. There is an answer. Is it that this nation is under God's judgment because of its apostasy? It's forsaking the light it had and turning its, its back on the God of its fathers. Or as we read the scriptures and when you read the Old Testament, God's judgment on a nation, God's removal of his blessing was because of his people and their apostasy, their turning to idols, their wanting to be like the nations around them, compromise and worldliness. I'll leave that one with you. But we need to pray that the Lord will raise up godly men, godly men in par and, and women in parliament, godly leaders, godly men in pulpits and in the churches who will realise that just preaching a woke gospel, a gospel of social justice, and a, and a gospel that tickles ears and appeals to man and says it will be all right as long as you live a good life or try to do your best and gets back to the gospel, back to the word of God, back to recognising a God who made them, a God who made us, a God who, who is sovereign and a God who will judge us all by Christ Jesus. So Paul says, despite what's happening, they were worried about him. They were concerned that he was in prison. He said, don't think that. He says, even in chapter one, he says, the fact I'm in prison has turned out for God's glory in the kingdom. He says, because I've had opportunities in prison that I wouldn't have had to witness to wrote the soldiers, the Praetorian Guard. And as they've had other ones, they've heard it. People in Caesar's own household are becoming believers. God doesn't make mistakes. And Paul recognised that. Paul recognised that God had put him where he was for a purpose. And my brothers and sisters, no matter where you are and what you're facing at the moment, remember, God has put you where he's put you. He sent you what trials, what blessings, whatever. Whatever's happening in your life is happening because that's what he has planned for you. He's begun a good work in you, if you're a believer in Christ. He's begun a good work. And he will complete it because he is the sovereign Lord God Almighty and nobody can stop him. I like the word um, in, in the original, in the original Greek that we've got stand firm in the Lord. It's from the verb stako. I, I, I like to do that because it gives me an aid memoir to remember the word. Why do, where do we use a stake for? If you plant a sapling, for example, a tree, you stake it. The stake's there to support it to keep it stabilised when the gales, the storms come, when the storms of life and the winds howling and the thing would be bent over or snapped off. Same with other tender plants. What's Paul saying? Be like that stake. Be unmovable. Don't waver. Don't be tossed to and fro by every wind of, of, of a doctrine. And don't, don't compromise and lose your stability in Christ because of what's going on around you. Right into the Colossians, just over the page, two, uh, two Colossians, Colossians 2, 5. For though I'm absent in body, yet I'm with you in spirit, rejoicing to see your good order and the firmness or the stability of your faith. Point one, our stability, our steadfastness 
in the Lord, in Christ. Secondly, verses 2 to 3. He talks about a couple of ladies. Now these were noble ladies in the church. Paul says they're fellow labourers with him. They'd worked with him. These were genuine Christians, committed to the Lord, committed to the cause of the Lord, despite opposition and potential persecution, well, not potential, actual persecution and suffering. But they couldn't get on. Now, isn't Satan subtle? In a church that's well taught, a church that's founded on the scriptures, splits, disagreements, grieving and quenching the God spirit is so often on secondary issues, isn't it? Personalities, minor issues. It could be the hymns we sing, the colour of the seats, all kinds of petty things so often in churches. The devil will try and get in. And Paul here is pleading for unity, agreement. But once again, he says, I, I entreat you, Adia, and I entreat soon 2K to agree in the Lord. You see, everything is in the Lord. You're not going to agree with people who aren't in Christ. You can't. They're, they're controlled by the God of this world, the evil one. They're blind to spiritual truth. You're not going to have ready agreement with them. What agreement is light with darkness? It can't have. With Christ, with the evil one, can't have. But in the Lord, we are to agree. We are to watch out for root, a root of bitterness. We are to not be selfish. He's already in chapter 2, of course, giving the illustration of the Lord Jesus. He said, he humbled himself. And he took the lowest place. He came from heaven's glory and he became a bond slave, a doulos, the lowest position in the uh, slavery in the Roman Empire. They had degrees of slavery. The bond slave, the doulos, was the lowest. Why? That he might raise us up in him. So Paul says, he pleads for the unity, the agreement in the Lord Jesus Christ. But notice what he does. He mentions Clement and he mentions the, the, the rest of the fellow workers. He says we've laboured with them. And he says he's asking um, that mature believers get alongside these two. Bring them together. In a sense it's knock their heads together. He doesn't put it quite like that. But get them back on the main thing. Alistair Begg, a well-known um, Scottish pastor bible teacher based in the states now who one of his favorite expressions is the main thing is the plain thing and the plain thing is the main thing you see it's all to do with getting our minds set if we remember who god is the god who has called us the god who's redeemed us the god who didn't spare his son but gave him up freely for us if we remember that we are owned by him, we're, ser we're to serve him, to serve the Lord Jesus Christ, then once we concentrate on him instead of on ourselves, we live in a world of selfishness. We live in a world of the so-called me generation. It's all about me. People in the world, especially younger generations, are very selfish and self-centered. The idea that this world is all there is. Grab what you can. Never mind anybody else. Just get what you can out of life and be happy. That's not what we are to be. We are to recognise and to follow, to see the example of the Lord Jesus. And if he who didn't think it robbery to be equal with God, because he was God, he was equal with God, as the second person of the triunity, which is the Godhead, but he emptied himself, so are we. We are to have that mind amongst us, which was in Christ Jesus. And so, Paul says here, recognising that the evil one is subtle, he comes in, he disguises himself as an angel of light. He doesn't always go about like a roaring lion. If, he came in, if somebody came in here and started saying, Jesus Christ is not God, and I don't believe in the virgin birth, and I don't believe in the resurrection, you're not going to be swayed by that. Satan's much more subtle. As Paul says to the Corinthians, he disguises himself as an angel of light. We shouldn't be surprised if his ministers, his servants, do the same. We need to be focusing on the main thing. And then we're not likely to be slipping. 
Thirdly, we come to the verse I mentioned earlier. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. Two things about this. First of all, in the original, it's a present active imperative. In other words, it's for now, it's continuous, and it's not a suggestion. I'm just getting towards the end of um, a large, nearly 600 pages biography of Hudson Taylor, written by his son and daughter-in-law. And one thing said towards the end of his life, when he had this vision for, he saw the need, he wanted to evangelise the whole of China. And he wanted a hundred extra missionaries out there. And he said, I searched through my scriptures. They found, they, they, they found this in his writings. He said, I searched in the scriptures, Old and New Testament, and I never once saw God in his word tell us to try to do something. It's do it. It's do it in his strength and his enabling. So here we have an instruction that humanly seems impossible. Remember Paul and Silas when they went to Philippi. Yes, they had the joy of seeing converts, of seeing a church, a, a fledgling church um, born and developing there. But they got wrongly accused. They had a Roman flogging. They were thrown into prison. They were stretched in the stocks. Their backs would have been raw and bleeding. They would have been... The, the stocks were designed to put you into cramps, so it just that would be agony. And at midnight, they were praising God and singing. How? That's not human. That's not human. Because they were rejoicing in... It's there again, isn't it? Third time. We've had stand firm in the Lord. We've had agree in the Lord. Now we've got rejoice in the Lord and keep on rejoicing in the Lord. You see, happiness is superficial. Happiness comes from happenstance. What happens to happen. If it's a lovely day, if my health is great, my family are doing well, my finances are well, then I can be happy. But if everything goes wrong, I get a bad diagnosis, a bad, bad diagnosis from the doctors, I lose my job. I have major disagreements at home, etc., etc. Then happiness evaporates, but joy isn't. This is the joy of the Lord. This is something deeper. This is something that only true Christians can know. This is the point. The world cannot know this joy. To people outside, what we're doing in here now is ridiculous. A lovely evening like this, and there's a few of you. It's lovely to see a younger person with us tonight, but most of us are getting on a bit. And the, the, most of the world's attitude is, you know, the church, Christianity is for old fogies who haven't got anything better to do. Or they haven't moved with the times. They're not with it. That is not the case. Rejoice in the Lord, says Paul. And again, now in the Bible, when something's repeated, it's for emphasis. That's how they wanted to say, Lord, the, the, the Lord above lords, you say Lord of lords. The king above kings, the king of kings. When Jesus wanted to say, as we have it transliterated from the Greek, Amen, Amen. Verily, verily in the King James. Truly, truly. I agree with that. It's repeated for emphasis. The song of songs in the Old Testament means the superlative song. And of course, the only triplet that we have, Isaiah 6, and again in the beginning of Revelation there, in heaven, holy, holy, holy. It's for emphasis. So when Paul says rejoice, and I say again rejoice, it's for emphasis. This is important. But notice, it's in the Lord. It's by his enabling. Paul could say, I can do all things. All things. Not by myself. Not of myself. But through Christ. That's it. That's it. Rejoice in the Lord. And I, I believe Hudson Taylor's favourite hymn was Jesus, I am resting, resting. Even when in the joy of what thou art. Even when things were grim. Even when there were major setbacks, as there were at times in China. But he was called by the Lord and his sole aim, like Paul's, was to make the gospel known. 
and to see people, men, women, boys, girl, boy, but girl, boys, girls, brought into the kingdom. And then my fourth one, I've taken this five to seven, but it actually goes on a bit as well. Contentment, trust. You see, we live in a world of, where people aren't content. They're greedy, they want more. He said that many years ago, Rockefeller, with his millions, was asked at the time, just how much money do you need to have enough? And he said, just a little more. And this is, is it, isn't it? The, the, the rich become more selfish, more greedy, wanting more. The love of money. It's not money. God gives us money. It enables us to use it for his kingdom and his glory. But the love of it, when the, love, the money controls you, then it's wrong. And um, so Paul's saying here, he says, don't be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be known unto God. But notice verse 5, let your reasonableness be known to everyone. The Lord is at hand. He's not referring to the fact that the Lord's returning soon here. He's saying live in the light of the, of the Lord's presence. Live in the reality of realising the Lord is with you. He's in you. And you are in him. Again, it's get your thinking right. It's like Romans 12 too, isn't it? Don't be conformed to this present age, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you'll know God's will. Then you'll see God's purposes. And then you'll realise just how wonderful they are. It's as we think, so we are. The mind influences and directs our emotions and our emotions direct our will that's why the gospel is words the gospel is preached it's based on facts it's based on knowledge and that knowledge becomes wisdom as the holy spirit gives us understanding and brings us into the full fullness of it so paul's saying here this is the case live recognizing who god is recognising who the Lord Jesus Christ is and that you've been bought with a price. You belong to him and as while he lives, you live. You cannot die. As we said in Philippians 1.6, God began the good work and you, you didn't initiate it. He began it. He will see it through. He will bring it to completion at the day of Christ, when Christ returns. So, he says, do this. Don't be anxious about anything. Be content you see, contentment depends on knowing that I'm in God's hands, that he's begun a good work in me. And in a sense, he's responsible for me. My responsibility is to trust him, to worship him, to trust the Lord Jesus Christ and to seek to live for his glory and to please him and to live a life of holiness. His responsibility is what happens to me tomorrow or next week or next year. It's trusting on him. The Lord Jesus said that about anxiety, didn't he? He said, don't worry about what you've got to eat. Pagans do that. Don't worry about what you're going to wear. Let God take care of those things. Your responsibility is to seek first his kingdom, his righteousness, and he will see to the rest. He knows what you need. It's easy to, we know these verses, it's easy to talk about them, isn't it? And we can say, that, yeah, that's wonderful, that's good. But when the rubber hits the road, do we actually do it? You see, I love the fact scripture is so real. It doesn't just deal in abstract terms. It deals with real life, real situations. God knows how weak we are. He knows that we're dust. He knows our humanity because the Lord Jesus Christ became one of us. He lived amongst us. Therefore, he can empathize and sympathize with us in our weakness these things are written to encourage us and to strengthen us let your requests be known to god but how in everything by prayer and supplication that's interesting isn't it time is going but we think of supplication so many prayer meetings are a prayer are just a shopping list really aren't they we come and we give god a list of our needs whether they're health whether they're whatever but prayer has the sense here of worship, of coming before God, prostrating ourselves before him. That's why we sang, O oh, come, let us worship and bow down. Prayer is recognising who God is. 
just quickly, the disciples' prayer, the so-called Lord's Prayer, but actually it's better the disciples' prayer, the Christian's prayer. It doesn't start with my needs and my material needs, does it? It starts with who God is. Get your mindset. Come into God's presence in prayer, recognising that he is your Father in the heavens. Recognising that he is holy. His name is separate. It's above. He is altogether above us. It's to be hallowed. His kingdom is the priority. His will. Then we come horizontally. Then we come to our needs. He knows about our needs. Our daily bread. Our sins. Etc. It's the priority. And so Paul has that order here. He says, come by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. That's often forgotten as well, isn't it? And Paul says, don't be anxious, come and pray. He says, it's more than that. It's with thanksgiving. We're to be grateful people. The old, the old hymn that um, you don't hear these days, count your blessings, name them one by one, and it will surprise you what the Lord has done. We're human and we're so apt to think of the negatives, to think of the negative little thing about people, to nitpick about a person and to ignore the good things. Some Christian, maybe it might be a relative, might even be your husband or wife, irritates you. and It's often on a trivial little thing. How often do we thank the Lord for the, the strengths and the good things? How often do we do it in a fellowship? Or else are we going to be like those two sisters at the top of the chapter there? who wouldn't agree and it was impacting the whole fellowship and the whole witness and stability of that fellowship. No, says Paul, this is how you're to pray. Trusting God, therefore not being anxious, being content in the Lord and therefore in everything coming in worship, recognising who God is and then making your requests known with thanksgiving. And what is the consequence of that? Verse 7, the peace of God which surpasses all understanding. It's not human. We can't understand it, but we experience it. That peace of God will guard. Better garrison. If this was a Roman colony. There'd be a Roman garrison there. And that town would be protected by this garrison of well-trained, well-disciplined well-armed soldiers. And that's what the peace of God is. It guards our hearts and our minds. It keeps our thinking right. It keeps our emotions right. You see the order? You see, it's beautiful. But we've got to keep it all there. We can't nitpick, and, or sorry, not pick, we can't cherry pick and pick out this bit and ignore the rest. We have to look at the context and put the whole thing together. Then, then we will stand firm and be enabled to stand firm in the Lord. One or two of you may have come across that Andre Crouch. Not long after we got married, we went out to the West Indies for a couple of years. My father's from the West Indies and he always said, when you get qualified, if you get the opportunity, go and uh, don't just go on holiday, go to Jamaica and go and live there for a while and work there and you'll get to really know the country. And while we were there in the church we were in in Montego Bay, where we ended up um, working, uh, we, um, they had a, a singing group, a large group, ages between upper teens to early 30s, I guess. And the joy was I, I played for them and kind of coordinated them. But really, I didn't have to do much because their voices and their harmonies, they just knew how to harmonise. I suppose it's Afro-Caribbean natural harmonies and depth of harmony. But at that time, um, they were into Andre Crouch songs. He was an American who produced a lot. And we sang quite a few of his as well as others. But one of them is called Through It All. And I'm just going to finish with this. I'm not going to read all of it, but I'll read the key bits. I've had many tears and sorrows. I've had questions for tomorrow. There's been times I didn't know right from wrong. But in every situation, God gave me blessed consolation that my trials come to only make me strong. Through it all, through it all, I've learned to trust in Jesus. I've learned to trust in God. Through it all, 
through it all. I've learned to depend upon his word. And then the last verse. I thank God for the mountains and I thank him for the valleys. I thank him for the storms he brought me through. For if I never had a problem, I wouldn't know that God could solve them. I'd never know what faith in God could do. Through it all, through it all, I've learned to trust in Jesus. I've learned to trust in God. Through it all, through it all, I've learned to depend upon his word. Paul goes on and later in this same chapter, he says, I know how to be brought low. In verse 11, rather, I've learned in whatever situation I am to be content. I know how to be brought low and I know in how to abound. In any and every circumstance, I've learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. Be encouraged. Be encouraged. You may be small, you may be frustrated that you seem to be having little impact on the community around. But God isn't going to judge us. We're not going to be assessed at the judgment seat of Christ on our results. The results, the fruit is God's business. The harvest is his business. It's our faithfulness. Continue being faithful. Be steadfast. Be immovable. Always knowing that your work, is, labour is not in vain in the Lord. Amen.